commentators, uh, and I uh, give the names in order. Uh, they follow the order of the presentations. That is Professor Sokjin Yu from the Department of Political Science at Sogang University. Then Markus Pohlmann, uh, Max Weber Institute of Sociology, uh, Heidelberg University. And Yi Wonso, Institute for East Asian Studies, also Sogang University. So. Thank you, Presider. Uh, my name is Sokjin Yu. I've been introduced by the Presider. Uh, I'll be commenting on the uh, success story paper. Well, I enjoyed reading the paper and I have three points to make in my discussion. The first point to read is a big question. Your key concept is on functional and institutional peace in Chinese political economy and the my first question is, yes, institution matters, but to what extent? How much can you explain the future of China or the coming uh, China's economic crisis by resorting to the institution, the other factors? So what I'm trying to say is that the, you are focused on, from the focus on the uh, institutional peace I would rather suggest to you to this socio-political peace between institutions and some deep-rooted foundations which affects institutions. So the, my comment is that the, the coming crisis might erupt, erupt when the institutions do not match with the foundation of the institution. Uh, for example, like a population structure the aging problem, the energy and food constraint, external constraint made by the United States, uh, domestic migration questions, and internal imbalance uh, between uh, the rural and urban sectors. So, so in Explaining the, at the last section, you say your title is Comparative Advantage, Institutional Peace and Destabilization. But you are, when you talk about the destabilization, you have mentioned three factors. Uh, the institutional compatibility and transnational compatibility. And the third factor, the how much weight the CCP will place on economic development and social justice. There's some institutions, there's some contradiction between institution and deep-rooted social background. That's my first point. And second point is on some minor points uh, in your paper. The, your argument about the state-permeated capitalism and the chronist but productive reciprocal relations. And you have mentioned that it might evolve into a ransacking state or the harmful type of corruptions. But it's on two sides of the same coin. So it's very difficult to say that this time, nowadays it's on chronist but productive relations, but it has a potential to become a ransacking and the, the very harmful type of corruption. So demarcation line between the productive but uh, chronist but productive state and ransacking state is very blurred. So I should, uh, I, I, I suggest you to make a clear distinction, which is the drawing line between the two. And the other point is that the, you have mentioned about, about the capacity of CCP and the, the, the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party and the cadre's capacity to control the bureaucrats and the business, business plans. And my question is whether that capacity question and the institutional comparability question move in the same direction. Or if you have more capacity, you might have less 
comparability. If you have less capacity, you might more have a com comparability. So is it moving in the same direction or is it contradicting with each other? It's not clear to me in your paper. And my third question is it's just a conjecture about the, uh, in my opinion, it's a very crucial factor in, in the forecasting the future of China. The, the, your, your arguments on the industrial relations and the Fugo system, household registration system, it just reminds me of the great work by Carl Polanyi, uh, which analyzed the transformation of uh, UK society. The, in my opinion, Fugo system in, in China is quite similar to the uh, Spinamland Act in 19, uh, 1795, uh, uh, enacted in 1975 and ab abolished in 1834. The, the question for the UK government at that time was that the, the displaced farmers might turn into a rioting mobs. So they are trying to disencourage the mobility of the farmers. That experience and land act was on, uh, in, uh, for that purpose. And the abolishment of the, in 1934, uh, 1834, was on truly uh, uh, turning the farmers into labor and creating the labor market for, for the uh, British industrialization. So I think how the Chinese government will react to the Hugo system will be very crucial factors in, in the, uh, forecasting the, the future of China. The, and also the, the Polanyi's argument on double movement, the one between self-regulating market and self-protection society. Uh, in Chinese case, it's not a self-regulating market, but it's on, uh, you, as you have termed, state-permeated capitalism. But in that case, also there will be a self-protection of society and how the Chinese government will react to that kind of uh, reaction from the mass. Uh, thank you. So many thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, think, I think it was uh, fresh and entertaining. And uh, <laughs> I, I fully agree with your diagnosis uh, that there are not as many foreigners uh, in Korea as in the United States. And uh, I also agree with the idea that it's always good to learn from uh, foreign cultures. Um, my questions are heading towards uh, the scientific foundation of your paper. So the first one is the war of talents uh, Four Talents is a book published by McKinsey, right, in 1997. So um, this book was about uh, skipping ideas of seniority, hiring freshmen from business schools and paying them far beyond uh, performance. So one role model was Enron, right, uh, in that book. And uh, there have been other role models. Uh, so there's an article uh, following up. And not a lot of these companies are well off today. So this is my first question. Uh, if this is really reasonable uh, to deal with that idea in scientific terms. Uh, the second question is uh, heading towards innovation. <clears throat> I think, you know, Silicon Valley is amazing, of course, uh, and we know it since I don't know how many years. Uh, but you cannot copy Silicon Valley. And if you could, there would have been some copies around, right? So I think and there's no cookbook for innovation or for becoming innovative. Uh, when we did research on that, on uh, innovation a few years ago, so uh, we found out there's one rule concerning innovation. Uh, uh, and the rule is, there's no rule how to become innovative. Um, that was at least our conclusion. So I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, if, if there's a cookbook and you just uh, take over uh, uh, Silicon Valley here in Korea. 
Um, and also the third point is cultural diversity. I think that's a myth. You know, um, of course we can, can learn from foreign cultures. Um, but uh, the economists in our departments, they did a big study about uh, teams in big companies. So they've been comparing homogeneous teams to cultural diverse teams. So what has been the result? The homogeneous teams did perform better and were more creative than the cultural diverse teams. So I don't want to generalize this, but I think that's just a myth to say, okay, we have cultural diversity and then we have innovation. So all three points are heading to the scientific foundation uh, of your paper uh, uh, and of your statement. Many thanks. Oh, sorry. This, yeah, it's just a structural problem. You speak. Don't, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. That's just water. It's just water. We will survive. <laughs> just take it. So thank you very much for your paper. Um, I enjoyed reading it a lot. And uh, as I introduced myself to you, I'm not a student of welfare politics. Uh, so I learned a lot uh, from your paper. And yeah, I have just a few comments or questions. First, not very informed. Um, so OK, so we have this uh, productivist and predatory regi welfare uh, regime. And, uh, Indonesia, well, state employees, very productive sector. Uh, but my question here was, um, so you put the rice scheme in the productivist uh, type of social policy, and you say fuel subsidies are radically different from uh, the rice scheme because fuel subsidies uh, benefit uh, big businesses. Well, it's true that the large portion of fuel subsidies are used to benefit big businesses, but from the view of the people who live on the street, I think maybe there's not so much difference between the rice scheme and the fuel subsidies because many people in Indonesia, as you know, drive motorcycles for their living, etc. So it was my small question uh, on the typology of uh, policies. Um, well, here uh, I could see that your paper is not into details of uh, decision making, actual decision making processes or political processes of social welfare policies for understandable reasons. Because once it starts to describe the, uh, all the policies and how they change it and what actors were involved, um, it is very difficult for, uh, to understand for people like me, you know, who are outside the field. Uh, so it was the, the really, really big benefit of this paper. But, uh, so because of the reasons, there were, were some uh, points that I could not, uh, it, it, some points that were not very clear to me. And the uh, first is about the three broad coalitions. So the first is technocrats and these mobile capital people, right? Internationally driven people, liberal people. And the second, domestic businesses and bureaucrats. Uh, from your paper, I couldn't see much difference of their positions towards uh, different social policies or cases of conflict between the two. Because the, so they are basically similar in their policy leanings, but slightly different because uh, domestic businesses and officials want to protect their um, privileges, right? And so I couldn't see how uh, much differences they actually uh, make. And so if they are not so different, are there really two different coalitions or just one? That uh, was my first question. And the second is, what do you mean by the poor? When you say poor, those under the national poverty line or some World Bank line or informal sector workers? those who are not insured by Jamsul Stack, or including, do you include all workers in the poor? Because if you uh, see, for example, Taksin Chinawat's pro-poor policies in Thailand, 
It says they are anti-poverty and pro-poor policies. The village funds the health care scheme and cheap laptops, cheap everything. But actually, most of the beneficiaries of these policies uh, are middle-income farmers and workers. Because this is about electoral politics, you know. If you uh, give benefits to only a small uh, number of really, really poor people who are under the national poverty line, you would not gain a lot from uh, electorally from those policies. So I think uh, it's better to be made clear the definition of the poor. And another small point about their NGO allies, uh, TURC maybe, but uh, it's very interesting that ASAM and the, the NGOs like ASAM and EJW also made contributions to the <laughs> social policies because I thought Indonesian NGOs have very specific issue area. They are not like political parties. So if I um, see the issues of past human rights abuses of Suharto, uh, there are different NGOs working uh, against Suharto's corruption and Suharto's human rights abuses, and they don't work, uh, each, work with each other, right? Um, so uh, it was very interesting to see that the NGO allies the major, all major NGOs work with the poor in Indonesia to, uh, for uh, social policies. And the first question is about labor unions. Uh, where are the labor unions uh, in the political processes of social policies in Indonesia? Because uh, there are protests in front of Jamsostek and everywhere. You know, uh, so they are doing something. I often see them on newspapers and to a lesser extent on Facebook. You know, the, the labor unions uh, uh, supporting a, uh, a certain position on the change of social policies. So are they an important actor or not? Um, and uh, also, my question is on the problem of state capacities which may be a major difference between East Asian development state and uh, Southeast Asian states, where predictably there are corruption and incompetence on the local level. And from the reference list, it's clear you know a lot about these uh, local problems. Um, uh, so do you think there is, is, there is a possibility that these local problems uh, would have influenced the way the central policies are designed um, as they are or were. And my last question is about um, the future possibility. Um, the paper indicates that the, at the end of your paper, it is indicated that the absence of leftist politics uh, is a major difference between Indonesia and uh, uh, maybe not North American, but uh, Western European countries. And of course, NGOs are very small and they lack mass basis. They are not like uh, leftist political parties. But what difference would have it, uh, been made if leftist politics were to have power in Indonesia now? Uh, or what difference would it make in the future? Of course, they will not make a leftist political party, but just uh, it's an imagination. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks all the commentators uh, and uh, all in time and uh, I would suggest that now the presenters answer first and then uh, we open the floor to further questions because you asked many and pertinent questions and uh, so late in the day we might forget them. So let's go first. Can I, have the, can I use the microphone? Uh, probably won't be able to answer all questions in three minutes. So, uh, so what we should maybe talk, nonetheless, bilateral uh, initiative proposed by me, uh, uh, let's, let's talk about this in more detail. Because I, for instance, found it very interesting, your argument that uh, the kind of labor relations and HUCO reminds you of Polanyi. So this is something which I didn't have touched upon in the, in the article here, but it clearly is of importance and, and of, of great interest in understanding and comparing different ways of industrializing, urbanization, and so on and so forth. Um, so, the one point I think maybe I didn't make clear enough in the paper was probably that my aim was not to explain the whole process of economic development in 25 pages. 
right? So this, this speaks to your question of further factors and everything. So the, the main aim is to, to, to say that a look, a comparative look at institutions and the fit of different institutions might help you in addressing some of these answers. So this is not the overall answer, but part of the answer. And I think something which, and it, that's I think why it's worth following it, which is not very much in use when looking at China. So uh, many, many scholars wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't take this way. Um, and um, yeah, clearly I didn't touched upon factors such as the so-called advantages of backwardness, for instance, such as the still uh, large reserve army of labor, for instance, yeah? and many, many productivity gains you can make when turning agricultural to industrial labor and so on and so forth. So all these factors I didn't touch upon, which are important, uh, but we, which were, were not the focus of, of, of the article. Um, the last point uh, I will make now is the question on productive cronyism and harmful forms of corruption. I mean, this is a kind of provocation in a way. And in this article, this is mainly used as a qualitative term in quotation marks, right? So there is no clear demarcation line here. Um, yet, and this is um, done in more detail in another article of uh, by, by me and other colleagues, which has not yet been published, um, but which is to do with the idea and a critical um, 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 discussion then of the idea that there is a kind of best practice of how economic growth comes about. And this is very much still have free markets, have the rule of law, and there you go, right? Good governance and so on. Then you have some cases, uh, in this paper I'm talking about, we are, we are comparing India, China, and Brazil, which have bad governance, no, rule, no, no good rule of law, and so on, especially China, and, which do not fit the liberal policy advisors and so on, and have high, very high growth rates in the 2000s. And again, this is not the overall, so part of the answer is maybe, let's have a look at how coordination, economic coordination, is done in these countries. And it's, it's surely not following the role model, but still produces, in terms of economic development, some productive um, effects. Um, so this is the idea, so, so why I, I use this, this, this term. Um, and um, um, something which I think has to be dealt with in more detail. One demarcation I would like to draw is that you might argue that harmful forms of corruption have to do with classical forms of rent-seeking, i.e. buying lux luxurious villas by local uh, officials or so, while productive cronyism may be associated with forms of investment. So, so that these cron that's why I'm talking of cronyism. I'm using this against the anti, uh, the, the, you know this, you, you know the old idea that the Asian crisis was made by cronyism, yeah? This was the, um, um, th that's why I probably also use this term. Um, but it should denote that here real investment is, is, is meant and that probably the f um, actors associate their investment with also a kind of national development strategy. And um, yeah, this, now, and for some time now, I would argue, has created problems yeah? and, and more harmful forms of corruption um, maybe have well, become more dominant. Yeah? And, and the next question then is whether the anti-corruption campaigns that are being driven now and uh, what their effects will be. Yeah? And this is for me kind of open question because it might lead to the destruction of some harmful forms of corruption, but it might also disturb intra-elite authoritarian forms of, of dealing uh, between state and business actors, mostly at the local level. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Shin. Okay, uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, you know, if I were to write a paper, I mean, as you suggested, I might have uh, mentioned more studies. Uh, but I think with all due respect, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by scientific uh, foundation. Because uh, let's say regarding uh, the impact of uh, diversity and innovation, uh, as far as I know, there are plenty of work to show that. I'm not sure about study by your colleague, but there are a lot of experimental studies and you know, other empirical studies. So, I mean, if you want to debate, uh, we can still do, but uh, 
uh, you know, I can mention a lot of uh, studies already done to show the positive impacts of diversity and innovation. And regarding global talent, also you mentioned some negative cases. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the trouble is that uh, regarding there's any scientific basis or not, it's uh, happening right now. I mean, if you look at, you know, Samsung, you know, electronics, uh, the major or the leading Korean company, uh, I think about one third of their software engineers came from India. Because uh, Korea is very strong in hardware uh, engineering, but very weak in software engineering. So, you know, they, they have to import, you know, those uh, technicians, professionals from foreign countries, because otherwise, they just can't do it. So in Silicon Valley, they are coming, always trying to look for good global talent. But they also admit that it's very difficult to attract them into Korea. It's not simply money issue, but then family and living condition and so on. So, you know, I, I, I know those uh, HR team from major Korean companies coming to Silicon Valley and they are looking for good talent, but they are having a difficult time, to be honest. So, and also I talked to some uh, HR people in uh, major Korean companies. So when I say innovation, diversity, global talent, actually, yeah, I think in you know, many, maybe if not all, in you know, many leading Korean companies, you know, within HR section, there are special team on global talent. So they recognize already they are working. And also, when I mention innovation, diversity, they are kind of like kind of laughing because they are saying, "Yeah, of course, you know, we have all good things on our, you know, you know company mission, you know, innovation, you know, diversity." But the main difference between, I would say, Korean and let's say American, you know, companies, okay, those uh, diversity is more institutionalized in American context, but in Korea, it remains at the rhetorical level. Okay, they put in the mission statement because it sounds great, because that's what other you know, you know, you know, companies are doing. But it's not institutionalized in Korea. So I mean, this is the area that I'm looking at more closely right now. So, uh, but I think I, I admit that uh, if I were to make a more really academic presentation, I could have you know, mentioned you know, some studies and reference, but then, as I said, I try to be more provocative because otherwise people don't pay attention. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> so. okay, cheers. Yeah, G1, thanks for your um, questions and, uh, and comments. You've um, raised quite a number of uh, issues. I'll try and uh, get through them as uh, quickly as possible. I'm guessing, Chair, I should try and um, keep to five minutes or so in my response, right? Um, look, the, the, the first one was about fuel subsidies and um, uh, I, mean, I guess essentially why they're not portrayed in the paper as being a, um, a kind of social policy um, in investment in contrast to uh, Ruskin, which is a sort of targeted rice subsidy scheme. It's targeted at the poor. And I think that's, I think that's precisely the point. The fuel subsidy is a general fuel subsidy. By and large, the benefits appear to have been captured by the middle class and, um, uh, and business, notwithstanding the fact that um, you, you know, there are uh, uh, poor people uh, benefit as well from the, uh, from the fuel subsidy because um, it enables them to get around on their motorbikes and so on. And I think that, you know, the key, the, key, the key difference is precisely that. I mean, Ruskin is, is definitely a sort of social policy initiative that has uh, poverty reduction um, objectives. It, it, it's targeted at the poor, the, the, the fuel subsidy is not. The, the, the fuel subsidies have been important in terms of the politics of social policy in Indonesia because they've constituted um, a very significant proportion of total uh, government spending at the national level. And in order to fund the social policy initiatives, um, the government has had to cut back on fuel subsidies. And in fact, um, uh, Jokowi, the, the, the current president, has just um, uh, axed them entirely um, with the hope of, or with the sort of indicated uh, intention of um, using at least part of the savings to fund further um, social um, policy initiatives. So the shift has been one from a kind of regressive um, 
uh, arrangement to one that um, uh, should be more pro-poor, so away from fuel subsidies that benefit the middle class and, and business towards uh, more targeted social policy initiatives uh, aimed at the poor. Uh, you, you asked about the sort of the first two coalitions, the sort of technocratic one and the one um, centred on uh, predatory, uh, bureaucratic and business elements and asked whether in fact they really should be, should be one coalition. I mean, I think that's quite a fair um, that's quite a fair coalition. I mean, in the in the in the in the paper, I say that certainly during the new order times and and into the post new order period, these two coalitions have effectively um, operated in unison. They've been the dominant um, uh, political uh, grouping uh, within Indonesia, uh, and in that respect, they've been a coalition of coalitions, if you like. Um, so I think um, you know. I think your your, your question there is um, your question there is fair enough. Um, and I suppose I would de defend my presentation of those coalitions by saying they they um, you know whilst they've operated in partnership with one another, they have had distinct interests. And you know the technocratic elements certainly wouldn't abide some of the things that predatory elements have gotten up to the corruption of the social program schemes and so on. Um, what do I mean by the poor? Um, I mean, again, a very, a very good question, a very fair one, um, because I don't define my use of the term um, in, the, in the paper. Uh, when I've conceived of the poor, I haven't understood it in terms of the proportion of the population earning less than $1 or $2 a day or anything like that. I've understood it more in, in, in relational terms. Um, perhaps in that respect it might have been uh, better for me to have referred to subordinate groups or something like that rather than the, ra rather than the poor. Um, uh, in using the poor in that term, it, I've, I've used it in a manner that's consistent with work that's been done by Caroline Hughes and, um, and, and Jane Hutchison, whose kind of lead I was, lead I was following in that respect. Um, you were interested to see that Indonesia Corruption Watch and ELSAM, which is a human rights um, NGO, um, had been active in relation to social policy issues. Um, this for me has been one of the, the sort of big revelations actually of, of, of the research that I've done in this area. Um, uh, you know, the, the reality is that more progressive social policies haven't been pushed in all cases by um, NGOs uh, that have had a dedicated social policy focus. In fact, there are very, very few of them. Um, Indonesia Corruption Watch, for some reason or other, has just ended up with the education space. I mean, as you're right, there is this clear division of labour between different NGOs in Indonesia, um, um, uh, which comes about as a result of deliberate coordination amongst them. They get together on a fairly regular basis and decide which organisation is going to go with which issue, um, who's going to you know, contest what court case, and uh, who's going to run what campaign, and so on. They're, they're resource scarce, and so they, uh, they they coordinate very closely so that they can use their, their resources to maximum effect. And for one reason or another, Indonesia Corruption Watch has just ended up with, with education and to some extent the health stuff uh, as well. Elsum's role has been relatively minor, uh, more, more, more a sort of supportive role to, uh, um, to Indonesia Corruption Watch. You asked about labour unions and where they are. Um, labour unions are in the are, are in the mix. Um, they were very very important around issues of um, social security and uh, health insurance in particular. Um, they engaged in what has probably been the biggest popular mobilisation around um, health policy um, health policy issues um, in um, uh, in recent times uh, in Indonesia when they mobilised in their thousands to force the government to. Um, implement the 2004 social security um, social security law. Labor, just um, to sort of clarify the earlier point, would, would meet my um, definition of the definition of the poor. I'm being told I need to stop, so look, I won't go on with the other questions. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, microphones, please? Yeah. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have a question to Professor Shin, and uh, uh, since you know, yesterday we talked about diverse uh, capitalisms in Korea, diverse, I mean, in, in Asia. I'm just wondering how the Westerners, North Americans or uh, Europeans, see you know different version of uh, Asian capitalism if they think different. Especially, you mentioned social capital. Uh, and the brain power. Uh, how do they, do they see the different versions of Asian 
uh, especially Korean, China, Chinese, and uh, uh, the Japanese brain power differently. How they, they see differently, and that, uh, and if you know the Westerners think this Asian value system or Asian culture has any specific uh, uh, distinctive characteristics to to the you know this brain power. What would be the you know those kinds of characteristics they might have, you know, that, which is different from the the social capital in in the Western sense? And my second question is that, that to everybody, future of since this session is future of Asian capitalism, but when you say and not just Asian capitalism, when you see the the recent incidents of uh, Volkswagen, you know, the the cases. I think the transparency or business ethics and those kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, besides the innovation, I think there's uh, uh, trustworthy or <laughs> justice and those kind of uh, business ethic in the future of uh, capitalism, I think, I think that's very important. And on the other hand, uh, our consumption uh, level in a global sense is very much related to the you know the music or those, those cultural products. So what would be the you know the age and culture affect the, the future of capitalism? Thank you. I didn't do that yet, but still I will ask a question. Tobias, productive cronyism combines well, different elements. Under which conditions, institutional conditions, does Cronyism become productive. I can, you know, the, the classic story is counterproductive and productive. So, what makes it what makes it pro productive? I would you have a reference for it too? Because it's quotable. Uh, my name is Miki Kim. Uh, I used to work at Dong University. Now I'm working at uh, Ramin University of China. And I question to Professor Shin. And the question may be somewhat related uh, with uh, Professor Joe's question. Uh, I'm very much interested in your uh, so-called innovative uh, uh, presentation. And then one of your suggestions is that uh, those Asian countries should have a, a diversity of multiculturalism as a new framework. But East Asia is quite different from uh, those uh, European or uh, those American countries, especially in terms of accepting immigrants. Because of that, uh, the, the tolerance rate uh, to the immigrants is very low in East Asian countries. So the maybe the reason why you suggest this kind of multicultural reason. I definitely agree with you. But the problem is that in Asia, I used to live in Japan for one year, two years, more than two years in China. And then I have kind of a flavor that uh, in multiculturalism in Asian countries uh, bring about a lot of problems also and a lot of conflict, uh, immigrants and uh, the residents. Okay? So it's very a uh, good idea and it should be that way. But uh, I'm just asking you, uh, do you have any kind of uh, uh, innovative idea how to deal with this problem. Okay. In addition, uh, since I have some experience in those countries, I had kind of feeling that East Asia as a, as a whole may be different from other uh, region of the world, but in each country, even though there are some similarities, but actually there are a lot of differences in each country. So your basic question is that, can East Asia compete with North America, then I don't know whether it is the uh, appropriate question. So, because as I said, each country is different, uh, so many differences too, even though there's uh, some similarities. Thank you very much. Uh, listening to uh, the yesterday and uh, today, and including uh, the Tobias uh, presentation, uh, I'm feeling like uh, we may need uh, the, the theory of a state uh, in plural form, not just capitalism, uh, just for example, the China, the state uh, of China. Uh, Western theory of the state uh, assumed as a nation state, 300 years, right? 
But from my experience, uh, the China uh, couldn't be explained by the theory of uh, the nation state uh, based upon the 300, 400 years in, from the West. But we, uh, to explain or to understand uh, capitalism in plural form, but we simply assume the one singular theory of the state, not in plural forms. But we, all, uh, of course, we are talking about the relationship between the state and the civil society, and the state and the, uh, the, the market or capital, or autonomy of the uh, jebel from the state. But what kind of state we are assuming when we talk about the, chi uh, the state of China? So I think that's one uh, comment. Uh, I mean, in the future, when we want to understand uh, we may need a uh, thing different for, uh, concept of the state uh, in relation to the, poor, uh, the capitalism in plural form. That's my comment. A uh, really quick question for Professor Shin uh, about your mechanism. Like, uh, as I understood, you're talking about innovation um, being influenced by cultural diversity. Uh, did you look into uh, corporate culture as well? Because I think um, innovation needs uh, space and time, and I know more people, I have to say, at least at my grad school, where 50-50 foreigners and Koreans, uh, where Koreans are saying we want to leave um, because uh, of, of corporate culture. So I wonder if you were looking at that as well. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm just interested in probing the the pessimism about the curtailment of uh, crony uh, capitalism and um, why, why do you think it's not possible to have some sort of, uh, you know, like antitrust uh, arrangement for the curbing of excesses in uh, terms of productive cronyism and then to be able to, uh, to you know, put, a, put a, how do you say, put a ceiling on the um, accumulation of particular kind of, of, of uh, spoils, and then yet at the same time allow the pursuit of spoil to be still uh, uh, permissible and then also uh, uh, productive. I mean, why, why couldn't you have, you can imagine why an antitrust law having uh, uh, a rule. <coughs> Just a, a remark on Professor Shim. I completely agree with uh, Marcus. You're out of control on the uh, statements about what the uh, benefits of um, uh, multiculturalism are for innovation. If you look at the data on, say, for example, engineers in the United States, still 75% of all engineers in the United States are white, according to the uh, census. And if you look at uh, you know, the uh, breakdown of Silicon Valley, it's still majority white. How do you explain the existence of innovation? No one would want to make the claim that diversity is hostile to innovation. But what actually produces Silicon Valley is way more than just simply the fact that it's diverse. And there are many other kinds of institutional and policy related uh, kind of factors that create the dynamism of Silicon Valley. What I think is an interesting question that needs to be posed is, um, is the effect that you think diversity is producing possible to achieve uh, in alternative ways? Say, for example, through a more open uh, regime uh, so that you have foreign direct investment in South Korea and you have uh, the exposure of the world economy in the context of greater trade and greater interpenetration without uh, immigration or something. I have a real simple question. Uh, Professor Liu also brought up about uh, corruption, and you mentioned about uh, the intra-institutional corruption. You mentioned about it. But uh, I would like to know, uh, since you mentioned that the Chinese system is uh, already in jeopardy, so what is, uh, whatever uh, you observed, anything related to, to social strain or backlash by the 
uh, intra-institutional elites. If you observe, or if you have any uh, opinion about it, can you tell us? So, I say moral hazard is very important to any capitalist society. Thank you. Um, so, if I understood your questions right, uh, totally didn't understand your question, by the way, Gary, <laughs> but we, we might address this later. Um, um, but, so on the question of productive cronyism, um, I think we should be aware that I don't use this in any normative sense here. So my idea is make it a sober analysis and see the hard facts. And the hard truth is that corruption, if the, in the way we understand this, might produce economic growth. And this is how capitalism, what capitalism is probably also about, right? Corruption, right? And um, intra-elite um, um, coordination that reduces uncertainties in a quickly changing economic environment, especially important for Chinese development, right? If you have close connections to the, lo the, mo the most important local state or your city a s a state official, it's, it's a good thing, right? And you want to keep these relations and you, you, you want to build up. Yeah? What made these alliances work? The conditions, especially conditions under which they create growth in a, in, 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 in a way. Yeah? So before I move on to this, let me say, this does not mean that I say, oh, that's a wonderful way of, of doing business, right? And I prefer an author authoritarian setting of, of uh, doing, but it's, it's an analysis of how capitalism also works, right? Probably not very uh, uh, good in a way, but, but this is how, well, this is kind of reality, right? Um, so the kind of conditions. So what made these alliances work? Normally, I mean, shared social and political backgrounds are mentioned when looking for factors that make for this enormous role of intra-elite coherence in China. So reciprocal Guanxi networks stemming from blood ties or friendly turns and resulting in a kind of intra-family work petition. This is a famous, the husband is the local official and the wife, the spouse, is the well-connected entrepreneur who, uh, there are many, many examples in, in, in the empirical studies on, on China, uh, as well as amity, so cadres who have strong ties to entrepreneurs. And then what, what is added to that is shared political backgrounds that often make for a conviction in the prevalent statist and long-term oriented developmentalism in this country. Yeah? Um, so I just read an, an article in the uh, Journal of Contemporary China, uh, which comes to the conclusion that individual private entrepreneurs in China, in comparison to OECD countries, care much more about the overall development of the private economic sector and development of specific industries, right? So, but another thing has to be mentioned, I was also mentioning this in passing, this is, this is competition. So. I think the most important precondition for making these business state alliances work was the competition between them. So between cities, between regions, um, that, that made them focus on GDP growth and what the Chinese sometimes call GDP fetishism, right? Um, so, and this brings me to, I, I, come, to, I can come, come to, you're absolutely right. Um, this brings me to a last sentence which means thinking of state theory in this respect would also mean to also think maybe of local competition states under hierarchical settings in, in, in China. Uh, uh, but this is maybe on an, an, another matter. Okay, thanks for uh, good comments. And I guess I'm quite successful in provoking uh, your thinking by getting reaction. You know, obviously I'm not arguing that uh, diversity is a panacea. Right. I mean, you know, earlier this year I went to uh, Brazil. It's my first visit. It's such a diverse society. But is Brazil really doing better than Korea or Japan? Probably not, right? Also, if you compare Northeast Asia with Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is much more diverse, right? But they're not doing any better than Northeast Asia. So. But I think that the, the reason I'm uh, emphasizing diversity is I, as I look at Northeast Asia, like especially Japan, Korea, China, what will be elements that has the most impact? 
So that's why I'm emphasizing uh, diversity as a key framework. But I'm not saying that you know this will solve all the problem and this will produce all the innovation uh, in those countries. It's not that simple. But more fundamentally, I'm looking for more you know social and cultural sort of underpinnings for new development in uh, East Asia. Uh, you know, as you know, in the past, there's a debate about Asian value. It was a good or bad. I mean, there's some good element, bad element, right? So, but the, what should be in you know, the main <laughs> basis of new Asian culture? I mean, that has to include more tolerance to maybe diversity and, you know, I mean, so I, I mean, I'm searching for some cultural and social underpinnings of new uh, economic development. But not only that, also, I'm struggling to find out how to institutionalize because you know, the, the mere diversity doesn't really make much impact unless it is institutionalized into policy and into framework. And I, once again, that's the main difference between, let's say, Korea and United States in terms of uh, uh, promoting diversity. So uh, once again, it's not an easy answer. But uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, what I call uh, you know, New Asia Project. That's uh, my name for this project. So uh, actually, I produced a book on global talent. It came out last March by uh, Stanford University Press. It's about global talent parts. I'm now working on uh, cultural diversity parts. They are all linked. So stay tuned. Maybe after a few years, I have another book on cultural diversity. Thank you. Oh, look, none of the comments, uh, questions were um, directed towards uh, me, so I'll keep um, my comments here very short. I'll just uh, buy into the, um, the the conversation about productive um, cronyism, though, um, because I think that the Indonesian case perhaps has something to, get, to, to contribute here. In the early 2000s, there was a bit of work done uh, looking at why Indonesia had managed to achieve an average growth rate over 30 odd years, this is prior to the Asian crisis of course, um, of around about 7%, despite having um, amongst the highest levels of corruption in the world. Under the new order, um, Indonesia regularly uh, topped or came very close to top of Transparency International's um, uh, corruption perceptions uh, index. And so this was a dilemma, I mean, because the conventional wisdom, of course, is that high levels of corruption reduce academic, uh, reduce um, um, uh, economic growth. Um, and um, um, there's some econometric um, evidence to, to, to support that, although I, I, I gather that, that that finding is 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 contested. But nevertheless, that's, that's, that's the conventional wisdom. And the answer that this work um, um, provided, and it was uh, work done by uh, Ross McLeod and uh, Andrew McIntyre in particular, was that um, it was all about the extent to which corruption was organised or not. So the argument that was made was that under, under Suharto, um, corruption was very highly organised. Um, it was organised in a, in a centralised, top-down manner and in such a way that you know, whilst corruption was pervasive, it never really got out of control and never acted as a break on investment. That was the crucial thing. Um, so the government, or the government was still able to make credible commitments to investors. Investors were able to feel confident that so long as they got into bed with the right cronies, their investments would be protected and would and would and would come off. And some people have subsequently, since the fall of the new order, where you've had a decentralised um, um, and democratic political system um, emerge. Some people have said that one of the reasons why growth rates have been lower in the post-New uh, Order period has been precisely the fact that corruption is now disorganised. Um, you have a whole lot of what uh, the Indonesians like to refer to as little kings, because every little um, uh, you know, district in Indonesia, and there are about 550 of them, um, uh, you know, are, are run by someone who's uh, got their own mafia and is in, engaged in, in, um, uh, in their own rent-seeking. Um, so things are much less, much less organized. Thanks all of you for this wonderful evening performance. And we are in time. <laughs>